Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. It's time to get aboard the syndication train again, and we're going all the way back for the full story from beginning of just little small investments all the way up to large scale syndications. This may be what you're thinking that you want your trajectory to be. So listen up. My guest is Mike Roeder. He's the managing partner of Granite Towers Equity Group. Today, we're going to talk about long term wealth and passive income really passive income from strategic value add multifamily. Let's go. This is episode 161 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Mike Roeder. Mike is the co-founder and managing partner at Granite Towers Equity Group. He oversees this is a lot. Operations, acquisitions, investor relations, and asset management. Mike is also the co-host of the podcast, Keeping It Real Estate, and the co-author of Four Steps to Successful Passive Investing. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on today, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to digging into the weeds. Yeah, exactly. The weeds are what we've been through. And you actually got started with single families, but have now gone large scale with multi. But when you think back, when was the first time that you remember real estate being something that you thought could play a role in your life in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. So like you said, I got started in the single family rental space in central Minnesota. So I currently live a little bit northwest of Minneapolis in Minnesota. And I was 20 years old, uh, was dating now my wife, she's been my wife for 15 years, but we were dating. We decided to get a house near campus, a four bedroom house. We were pretty young, you know, didn't have a lot of money saved up. Yeah. So we house hacked that house. Yeah. You know, we, we went in there, we bought an old house. It was built in 1924, rented out three of the bedrooms to our buddies. We lived in one of the bedrooms. And that's the point where we fell in love with, you know, being landlords and also the cash flow that residential real estate or real estate in general can provide. Yeah, it's funny. The the older you're not old, I'm old, but the older that my guests are, the more most people have done the single family to, sort of room hack model because it was just smart and there wasn't all of these things out there telling us new acronyms and everything. But there must have been something about both of you at around 20 years old still in school that together said, "Hey, like let's make an investment." Did you think you were a real estate investor when you bought or do you just think you're making a smart play for the future? Yeah, we thought it was just a smart play for the future. <laughs> I mean, it, it originally just started out as the one house. We're like, hey, let's do this. Let's cover most of our bills. Worked out really well. And so we started to, to accumulate single family rental properties, you know, yeah. one by one. And my initial goal was to have 100 single family rentals. I didn't know how long it was going to take me, maybe 20 years, maybe 30. Yeah. Who knows? But I got, you know, a handful of single family rental properties and I was doing the property management. I was doing the leasing. I was doing the event. Yeah. I was doing all the maintenance to try to get them to cash flow. And I got burnt out pretty quick and, you know, started to realize there's got to be a better way to build up my passive income and to build up my wealth and my real estate portfolio. And at that point, I had been talking to my longtime friend. We had been really good friends since we were 16. He was a professional snowboarder. He had been advised to buy multifamily to offset his tax bill. Mm. It was working extremely well because he had third-party management in place. He was buying in better markets. And so we ended up going into business together and we bought a couple of small apartment complexes. And that's really where my mindset shifted. And I started to shift over to multifamily instead of the single family. Yeah. Were you weighing appreciation value? Because a single family appreciation is still good, but it also it does eliminate scaling a little because you can't just pick up and get 80 units in a day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's the forced appreciation in multifamily real estate, which we yeah. really love. You know, single family, you're dependent on 
the neighboring properties or your competitive properties and what the market's doing. Whereas in multifamily, you know, like you said, you can get the economies of scale, but not only that, you can drive the net operating income up through value add strategies and really force the appreciation of the property. So we definitely fell in love with that when we shifted over to multifamily. Yeah, that's a really good point because I, I, I see forced you know, in quotes, appreciation on both, but there's so much more scale in multifamily because for a newer listener, when you force appreciation on a larger asset, you're not as concerned with the location. And as you were saying, what's next to it, because you basically have a self-standing complex with some amenities, hopefully you're adding more, but that single family, you just might not be on a great block. So even if you make it the best house, you've just, you know, topped out the block and then there's not much you can do. So you started to see this scale in terms of doing the overhaul and getting much more for your time and energy, right? We did. And, you know, at at first it was pretty minimal because we bought a 20 unit, we bought an eight unit and, you know, we, we bought in the wrong market. We bought in a market that we grew up in. It was our Mm. hometown. We knew the market. And that's why we invested in that market. And looking back, I wish we would have dug in more and researched and maybe partnered up with someone that knew a lot more about multifamily because yeah. we probably could have five extra money. Whereas, you know, we just broke even on those first multifamily properties that we acquired, you know, way back when. Yeah, I I can see that. But I, I guess you probably felt more comfortable just because you did know the area better. And when you're young and even, you know, getting older and you're trying to get into that scale, it's scary to say, like, when somebody says, hey, let's just try three counties over. And you're like, that uh, that's I don't know that area. You know, I didn't go to ride bikes down the street. When did you realize the transition and how you could make it that it would eventually be more profitable that way? Yeah, great question. So after a couple of years of owning those small, you know, multifamily deals, we ended up deciding that we were going to go the syndication route. So we were going to start raising capital from limited partners that wanted to invest in multifamily, but maybe they didn't have the time or the money or the knowledge to do so. And so at that point, we joined a a couple mentorship groups. We started going to other markets and educating ourselves on what market would be the best to invest in. And that's really where we found Dallas Fort Worth, you know, market, also Nashville. And we've invested in a couple other markets as well. And we started to, you know, diversify a little bit outside of our hometown and what we knew in Minnesota. Yeah. And that also seems to scale from, I guess, a kind of mom and pop hometown business to something that's larger that fits syndication. But I've so I've talked to so many people who who started smaller, obviously got into syndication. And a lot of them get to that point when they're ready to take other people's money. So I want to know what you're going to say is that you start doing well on those other ones, or it looks like you're in motion. And then the friends just start saying, hey, I'd like to do that, but I don't have the time. Is that how the first kind of idea bulb popped up for you guys? That's exactly right. You know, we were doing pretty well with those first few multifamily deals. They were cash flowing nicely. And we had a lot of individuals asking us how they could get involved. So that's where we, you know, jumped into the syndication realm. And like you said, you're dealing with other people's money. So it's a lot, lot more responsibility. And you just have to make sure that you're doing your due diligence and that you're, you know, putting your full heart into it and that you have time to actually asset manage because you're dealing with other people's money, which is so much more important than your own. Yeah, well, I like that you said right away, the first thing that you guys did was join masterminds or get coaching on it, because, you know, as well as I do right now, there's a lot of, I guess, quasi syndicators, which fits the more guru model out there, where they didn't really, they just, they're probably really good at marketing, maybe the property is good, but I don't think they really understand syndication. So you guys went in, got a little bit more deeper ground in what you were doing, so you could make sure that you kind of caretake the money better, right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And I think that building that knowledge base and, you know, maybe even piggybacking off of someone that's had a lot of success doing what you're looking to do, I mean, that's going to alleviate so many mistakes and help you, you know, do better for your investors. And if, you know, you get the chance or if anyone on here gets the chance, you know, check out our ebook as well that you mentioned at the start. And it kind of goes yeah. through the process of a successful passive investment. And it can be used for active investments as well if you're doing your own. But, you know, just getting to know, like, and trust the general partnership team, absolutely critical. Researching the market, you know, knowing yeah. the market that you're investing, because that can have a huge impact on how successful your deal is. Analyzing the property. I mean, you have to be able to look at the numbers and understand what's going on because the smallest adjustments can make the biggest, 
impact on the returns. And then knowing the team, you know, the general partnership team and the team behind the team. So, you know, who's going to be doing the taxes, the legal work, you know, the cost seg study, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, it sounds like you were really setting yourself up for success where some people in the today's culture where everything is so short term, they're flying blind quickly to scale too early. But if you look at your trajectory, it's very smart. Multiple single family rentals. Okay, maybe this isn't the way to scale you know, an eight unit, a 20 unit, that that's great experience. But you you said something so important. You didn't 5X those. It's really hard to 5X that number because you're new at it and there's not as much overall scale for the units as if you turn over half, then, hey, now the other half's going to be worth more also. What was the number that changed when you guys made a bigger investment so you could maybe help people? 20 is doable, I think, for someone even on a self-management, it's a lot. But what number do you think is one that's like really the the linchpin up generally, not like 42 or something? Yeah, great question. So we, you know, we slowly scaled. So it took us probably about 11 months to do our first syndication when we started looking at properties in Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, Minneapolis, a couple other markets. So like you said before, it takes time, you know, real estate takes time. But our first syndication after those first couple small apartments was actually a 45 unit. So it was a pretty small deal in Western Wisconsin. And then we did an 86 unit down in Texas in the DFW market, and then 101 unit, and we slowly scaled up. You know, looking at it now, we like to target properties that are 150 or more units. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the reason for that, obviously, you have the economies of scale, you're spreading out risk. But the really nice piece is you have multiple on-site team members at the property level. So yeah. you know, let's say you have a leasing agent and an on-site manager. Well, if one goes on maternity leave or if one gets sick or if one gets fired, you have another person in the office that already knows yeah. the property. So you're not scrambling. The same thing with maintenance tax. So... That's one of the main reasons why we target 150 plus units. Yeah, right? that makes a lot of sense. But I, I, I just really like that your first syndication was only 40 because then you don't even need to get that money from that many people. Do you remember how many people invested in that 45 unit? It's probably not that many. Yeah, we raised five hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. So yeah, I believe it great. was like 26 people that invested in that first project. And it's yeah. funny because you know, looking back, we were nervous. We had never raised funds <laughs> before, and it went extremely quick. It was actually one of our best projects, you know, that we've ever done. But uh, yeah, I think I think scaling up slowly like that is okay. Yeah. So when you decided, hey, we're going to take some money, you obviously had some people who were interested already. But how did you get over the hump of being the people who are now going to ask people for a sizable amount of money and make sure you were really prepared to deliver what people want. And it could be from anywhere, because as you know, now you deal with a whole bunch of different kind of investors, accredited, -accredited, Mm non-accredited, what they're looking for. Some people are just going to sign anything and other people are just going to like granularly mess up every single part of what you send out. How did you get over those humps to make sure you have a deliverable that's going to be attractive to investors? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of different ways. You know, first, setting yourself up to be the real estate professional, you know, that people know that you're the individual that's in this space and that's knowledgeable and that's doing it. So, you know, start up a newsletter where you're putting out content or, you know, post on social social media, whatever you can do to kind of, you know, build up what you're doing. Otherwise people just don't know what you're doing. And will be surprised if you just come out with a deal and they've (laughs) never heard that you're in real estate before. So that can be extremely helpful. You know, make sure that you're, communication is on point, you know, that what you're putting out there is very professional and that you've done your due diligence and you know your numbers because you're going to be having conversations with these individuals and you need to know what's going on and be able to overcome their objections or answer their questions. So that's critically important as well. And, you know, I know we were talking about mentorship before, but it's just, it's such an important piece to the puzzle, especially when you're in your start of your investment career And maybe you haven't done it before. So make sure you're piggybacking on someone else that you can lean up against or, you know, that can help you with some of those questions or those investor inquiries. Yeah, I've always thought it's great when you have your pitch deck ready for your first syndication or really any syndication is to really bring in some big guns to run through it and ask you every question. Because then if you can incorporate and answer all of their questions into it, your general novice investors are going to be blown away. Yep. because you've had someone help you. And that goes to the mentorship. Where were you able to find mentors and these things that could really help you go much faster? 
and, yeah. and, and more carefully, I would say. Yep. So for us, you know, my business partner, Dan Breezy, he had joined, gosh, I think six different mentorship groups. And so oh, he really he went out, in. <laughs> yeah, he had been out a lot of different groups. And really, after he had done that, he started to talk around and hear about, you know, what multifamily mentorship group was really successful and, yeah. you know, putting out successful results for the people that were a part of it. So that's really how we found the mentorship group that we partnered up with down in Dallas, Fort Worth. And, you know, I would just say, research it, try to talk to other people that are in those groups. And you can pretty quickly, you know, weed out a lot of groups and figure yeah. out, you know, the three, four or five that are being really successful. And, and you want to make sure that it fits your niche as well. So if you're, you know, in mobile homes or you're in multifamily or you're industrial, you want to make sure it's a group that's really focused on that niche. Otherwise, it's just going to be general information that you're getting. Yeah. And there, there's plenty of that. And I also think you want to be in a group where there's people above you. So you're playing in a higher room so you can learn more. But I, I've always thought it's helpful to have a couple, not a whole bunch of newish people, but people below you too, because then you can help them. You get a lot out of that and see some holes in your business. How has that changed for you guys? Now you have a lot of experience. How do you choose who you can help as a mentor? Because this is something that new investors, but this is, let's talk about it on the syndication end, because this is complicated. So usually people coming for help to do a syndication were like where you guys were, hey, we're we're almost there. We're managing, you know, 30, 40 units. How do you get to the next level? For you now, how did you decide who's worth helping? Because I think that may help people present themselves better. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of individuals that we, you know, help provide value to are providing value to us. So maybe yeah. they're you know, kicking in and helping out with the capital raise or doing some of the CapEx projects after the math. So I would just say if you're out there and you're trying to get your foot in the door, communicate with the general partners that have done a bunch of deals and tell them what value you're able to provide to them. And, you know, personally, we've had quite a few individuals where they come in and they're working for free, but they're getting to know our systems and our processes and our team and how we communicate and there's just so much value in that, regardless of what career or what business you're running. If you're new to it, you know, just try to get your foot in the door and provide as much value as you can. Yeah, that's great advice. I really, I think it's important for people to know you have to have something to give. You can't just raise your hand and say, hey, help me. Well, it has to be a good use of your time, too. So the win-win battle is there. And I think people forget they have a lot of other skills. You don't all, they don't all have to be real estate generally related, yep. you know, to be useful. Web developers are awesome if they want to invest. Like, cool, now I got a new website, you know, or someone who can help fix that. So I think, yeah, that's definitely helpful. On the apartment end, though, I want to go into a few things because I think this is always interesting talking to apartment syndicators. We got your number where now you're looking like 150 and up. But in terms of what you guys do, are you looking for value add properties or are you looking for higher occupancy that you can turn over and just make a little bit better? What's your ideal apartment complex look like for what you're trying to do? Yeah, that's a great question. So looking for value add opportunities where we're coming in, we're sticking in ten to twenty thousand dollars per door in rehab. So about half to three quarters of that will go towards the interior units and then the remaining towards the exterior, just as an average. Yeah. However, we are looking at projects that have really high occupancy. And if the project doesn't have really high occupancy, we want to make sure at least the submarket is in the mid nineties plus. Yeah, because we want to ensure that there's that pent up demand, so that way we can implement our value add, and you know know that we're going to be sitting at a really good spot for occupancy. We're also looking at properties that have very low delinquency. Yeah, so you're probably well aware of this. A lot of the listeners are aware of this, but delinquency has been creeping up across the nation. You know, with inflation, you know, hitting so many markets and so many people very hard over the years. So you need to pay close, close attention to that and just make sure that your investor or sorry, your renters are going to be able to afford the pro forma rents that you're looking to go to. Another thing that we do is we like to jump into the market and get primary data from the competing properties. So we'll go in and we'll shop those properties yeah. at the prospective tenant and we'll figure out what upgrades they're doing, what they're charging for other income, you know, for rubs, utility bills, pet income, carport parking, what kind of amenities they're providing. And that will all, you know, that'll give you information on whether or not you can actually do what you're doing and if it's been proven out in the market. So those are a few things that we're looking at. 
I love the last one because that that strategy is routinely used in self storage because self storage nobody those operators don't care they'll answer every question. It's a little harder in residential. You really have to fake it well to be that person, but that can really help you because if it's advertised at say twenty four hundred rents for a two bedroom and you call and they're immediately cutting it to eight hundred, you know eighteen hundred, you know they have a problem. That's right. So, yeah, that that can help a lot. What about configuration of units? Do the bedrooms the accounts matter to you? Or are you looking for something specific in each market? Yeah, very interesting question. So it matters a lot. And, you know, when the economy is doing great, it matters less. But, you know, when the economy starts going down or you see delinquency creep up, a lot of people tend to partner up and they go into a two bedroom or yeah. a three bedroom. And so we're targeting properties that have a lower unit count of one bedroom and efficiencies because of that. And we've seen that across our portfolio. So we have just shy of 3,000 units. And the one bedrooms right now over the last 12 months have been tougher to rent than the two and three bedroom units. So we want to make sure that there's a good unit mix. You know, if it's a property with all two and three bedrooms, great. But if it's a property with, you know, 70% one bedroom units, we're probably going to pass on that unless there's some specific reason that that makes it really, you know, intriguing. That, that's also a really smart landlord decision, because if you have two people on the lease, each are responsible for the entire lease if you don't have a master signer, which really they both become master signers. So for people who don't know, obviously, you have one tenant, one responsibility, they lose their job, you're not getting paid. If you have two tenants, and one tenant loses the job, the other tenant's still responsible for the whole lease which helps protect you. That's a really interesting strategy because I know some people who have focused on studios also because that's like the live alone thing, but it's much easier for them to partner up and roommates get more rent than families, right? I mean, if you have a two bedroom, you can progressively earn more from roommates than you can from a family just because they are basically rent by the room, like how you started. You got it. Yeah. And that's the income that the individuals are making. I mean, that's something you need to hone into. And we pull industry reports where we're seeing, you know, the neighborhood income, we're seeing the one mile, the two mile, the three mile median household income. And just make sure that you're paying attention to that and that you're, you know, ensuring that you're going to be able to hit your pro forma rents and they're not going to be too expensive for the residents. Otherwise, you're going to deal with, you know, higher delinquency than you thought. Yeah, and, and long occupancy chains where you're not going to have it the way that you want it. It may have been 90, but if you overprice, you're going to get it back to 75. And that, yep. you know, 150 units, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> it does. It certainly does. Hey, it's Jonathan. On this brief interlude, I want to give you an update because our new website has launched. Zen and the art of real estate investing.com is live and you can go there and check it out. I really want you to go check it out because we're going to still be upgrading more, but it's going pretty well so far. This is a very guest focused podcast website. Each guest has their own profile with their own links, links to our 10 minute clips on YouTube, and also links to the episode. You can search for guests using the alphabet or you can search in the search bar. Soon we're gonna have tags up as well so that you can search in certain categories, short-term rentals, mid-term rentals, syndicators, multifamily, and then you'll be able to link to the episodes on that. I have really put a lot of time into working with my team to get this website to be extremely visitor-friendly and very guest-friendly. I hope you enjoy it. At Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing.com. Let's get back to the show. What neighborhoods are you looking in the classic qualifications of ABCD? What's your preference in terms of what you're looking to get in at and what you want to turn it into? Yeah, great question. So B and C class properties are where we specialize. We do have one A class property up in Nashville. And typically, A class doesn't fit our criteria. It's really tough for us to make the numbers work. But that's it's a limited value add when it's A already. It's like it have to be a dump in an A, really, which doesn't. Then it's not really an A, you know. Yep, that's exactly right. And you know, for us, our A class property that we brought on, it was really unique because it was built in 2016, mm. had a massive gym area and area that wasn't being used. So we put seven retail, seven offices. Oh, nice. And where, you know, half of the gym was. We still had a great gym. We were able to rent out all the offices for about $850 a piece. We're in process of putting a few more in. So it had that value add aspect of the deal. 
And so that's really the only reason that it worked out for us. But, you know, back to your question, B and C class properties where, you know, the market rent is substantially higher than what the property is charging is what we're targeting. And, you know, we usually go in and we fix up all the deferred maintenance. We're upgrading the interior units. And once we get done with it, you know, we're definitely upgrading it to the next level. Yeah, I, now I, that, I'm glad you said that. That helps me remember a question I was going to ask before, but of course we were on some other cool topic. But in terms of the changeover, if you're buying apartment complexes that are 90% occupied, how do you handle that renovation 10 to 20K a unit? Are you waiting until they're releasing or they're moving out and then doing it? Or is there like a another, because because it could be a long time depending on when all the leases on how to get the whole thing transferred over. Yep. So we do do it on the lease renewal. So whenever the lease re renewals come up and someone renews their lease, or if they move out and there's a new lease plan going into place, that's when we're going to do our renovations. Now, a lot of our projects will have 70% plus retention. So like you said, it takes a long time yeah. for that unit to actually turn over. And what we'll do is we'll still push the rents to our pro forma projections but we give the current resident the option to do a partial upgrade. So maybe some new appliances or a new lighting package or a new you know, mirror for their vanity or a combination. So that way they're still getting some value and they're not you know, getting angry because their rents are just being pushed up. And then we're still able to you know, output some of that ca those CapEx dollars, make the property nicer and keep that retention high as well. Yeah, I have two questions for you. These you may not have heard, but I like to come up with some oddities. Have you ever, th this goes more to what people are doing in, I guess, midterm rentals now. Uh -huh. If you had a large enough complex, would you ever consider having like two furnished units where you could move someone out for, because these are like one week rehabs and a lot of these move someone into the furnished unit, punch out the rehab on their unit, get their rent up and then put them back in and keep doing it again. Would that work? So I, I think it would. And we actually have a few Airbnb units at several of our complex. Right. So you yeah. can easily do that. We haven't implemented that up to this point because we do those partial upgrades. But I think that's a great idea, Jonathan. Well, I've seen it a lot in midterm rentals and residential, like for single family midterm rentals, because we have so many home sellers or home buyers one are doing renovations so they need to move somewhere in a totally residential area for three months but like they're used to a big house so i'm thinking of it on a smaller scale and i'll tell you why i thought of it because when you were talking about the office spaces did you lease those out outside or did you offer them for for people who wanted businesses that already lived inside and then i'll get to my other thing <laughs> We did both. So we have several, you know, residents from the apartment that, you know, was renovated that are renting out those offices. And then we have some outside leases, you know, from yeah. commercial tenants outside of the complex. That makes, yeah. I, Cause I've, I've, I saw co-working fail in general, like just mm -hmm. with WeWork, but when it's contained inside a development already, I could see co-working spaces be a hedge too. You know what, like, because the way that I'm looking at things more now, like, you know, going back to your time when you're buying apartments, if you're looking at a small scale multifamily now, just say three or four units, you could have three long-term rentals and then one short-term rental to punch up your lease. So I've even thought about this in office because I don't think those large scale co-working spaces are really going to work anymore because they it's too much real estate. But yep. this small scale, if, if like people who lived in the area could come in, knock out a few hours, it's kind of interesting to me. I'm just trying to figure out, like, do these things apply? And can you see that working in a development? Because if you have 150 units and a lot of people transfer to work from home, but maybe they don't want to lease a full office, and and their apartments aren't that big, you know. Yeah. So is that something that could be on your radar too? Yeah, I think it could be a great great avenue. And you know, just to share a little bit more, you know, that A class property where we have those seven offices, we have another three that are going in. Oh, the offices were at the A. Okay, that yeah, that, that that's interesting. Yep, they're too. at A class property, and I think you know you need to cater to your residents. So yeah. if you have a C class property, very unlikely that you're going to rent out an office like that yeah but this a class property you know we have a list of people that are wanting to get into the future offices that are being renovated out and one of the reasons is we're providing more value so you can go somewhere else you know into an office space and get a similar office for a similar price but at the apartment complex we give them access to the amenities so they have a saltwater pool they have an awesome workout oh that's awesome a community area so they can utilize all of that 
you know, and they're paying, you know, essentially the same price. So I think that's what a, what's a trap for a lot of those individuals. Yeah. Yeah. And even for the people who live there, then you have no commute. If somebody who lives there, they're, you mm-hmm. know, they, they close their law office, but they still operate. Now they can just have a little thing and, and they, they're already in there. That's a win-win for them too. That's a great strategy. And the way that you executed it is also similar to what people do with self-storage, you know, self-storage is, hey, look, there's another whole row there where we can put more stuff. Yep. So you knew that the either the was the gym too big or there was just other wasted space there. Yeah, it was it was too big. I mean, it was massive. <laughs> you don't need a gold. No one ever goes. They're like, oh, I get a gym for free. And then they it's like no one's ever in there. It's like a hotel gym. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that, but those are really smart ways of figuring out how to add small scale amenities that could really affect your long term value. Because, I mean, just the idea that someone could rent from outside and get access to the amenities is big. Don't need a gym membership. Don't need a pool. You know, you can work. You can work your law job and then just go take a dip. That sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> it's it's super awesome, and they love it. And you know, if you factor in eight hundred fifty bucks a unit, let's say ten offices. You know, you're you're increasing the value over two million dollars. You know, if you take that divided by a four and a half cap, so it's yeah. you know you can provide you can again you can force the value up, and that's one of the beautiful things about multifamily. Yeah, I think that goes to the economies of scale that we were talking about in the beginning, and why it started to change as you scaled up, because you really can five x at this level. Because just at that that ten to twenty thousand dollar renovation, which again only really takes a week on a small unit. Can, if you do that over the long scale, you know, in four years, you're going to be up. So just say how much, if, if you do a 10 K renovation, how much does it increase the value? Like, are you getting a double on that? Like, are you at a 20 K increase? Cause I think over time, you're probably up a little bit more in those markets because it can make such a difference. Just 10,000 on a small one or two bedroom apartment. Yeah. I think it, it depends on the property, but a lot of times, you know, maybe three to four X what yeah. you're, you know, okay. putting in for the renovation. So if we're putting 10 K into the unit, you know, you might be increasing the value by 30 or $40,000. Yeah, but that's huge. Like if you count that across yeah. 150 units, that, that if people go back and they're listening again, and they listen to the beginning, when we were talking about it, this is exactly where we were getting to. You have much more scale. You can only do so much at 20 units. It's, and it's not going to be the same scale also, because it's a different product, less amenities, smaller footprint, less parking. Yeah. Really interesting. So how did you choose these markets? I know you, you were in a mastermind that was in Dallas. So you know, DFW is probably interesting and you had a lot of opportunities and Nashville, of course, everybody knows, but it sounds like you got in at a really good time because Nashville's bigger, I think, than people think. Yeah. And there was, there was a few reasons. I mean, obviously we did the initial research. So we were looking at job growth, population growth, you know, is the state and city, you know, business friendly. Those were super important to us. No state income tax in both, you know, Tennessee and Texas. That was super helpful. And then also deal flow. So that was one of our problems when we started syndicating is we were just looking in Minnesota and there's not a lot of deal flow. A lot of owners hold their properties long term and stuff just doesn't come up on the market. Whereas Dallas Fort Worth, I mean, there are so many investment opportunities down there, multifamily properties that come to the market. So that was super important to us as well as just being able to underwrite, you know, 100, 200, 300 deals a year. So that way we could kind of pick through the weeds and find those diamonds in the rough. And then, like you said, being part of a, a mentorship group and an ecosystem that really allowed us to get our foothold down in DFW. In Nashville, it's actually an interesting story. We had a third gentleman that we had known for over a decade. He had done a ton of relationship building in the Nashville, Tennessee market, and he brought us an investment opportunity. And, you know, it just looked fantastic. We loved Nashville. We had done some research on the market. Yeah. And so we jumped into that market with that third individual. Yeah, that's great. And I think it shows that you can you can figure out other markets, but there's also a big weather differential between doing Minneapolis investing, which is definitely colder mm-hmm. than than yeah. Texas. Did that play at all? Because you're also you didn't go to Florida where insurance premiums are higher. I guess they're climbing in Texas also, but not necessarily as much in Dallas. But those are a little bit, I guess better climate wise, in my opinion, because that's what I'm looking at a lot of climate things now in terms of where to invest, just because it's a little haywire out there. I'm trying to hedge my bets on, you know, less tornadoes and less, you know, crazy rainstorms, anything like that. 
did that yeah. play a role in in those decisions? It did. You know, we've we've considered Florida, we've considered Houston in the past, and we just decided against going into those markets because of the fluctuations. You know, Houston in general tends to fluctuate a little bit more with the economy. Plus, you have you know, like you said, the hurricanes, um, the storms, insurance premiums have skyrocketed in both yeah. markets. So. You know, just to mitigate risk a little bit more, we've chosen the markets where you don't have, you know, so much fluctuations. Yeah. I mean, that that's tough because the same economies of scale apply. If you have a tornado and you have a single family, okay, you know, you have 150 units, you're going to have a lot of problems with the roof. You know, it's just things that can come up that yeah. are interesting. Exactly. So, so yeah, for, for someone now who wants to invest in a syndication, what are some things that you guys talk about? in the four steps to successful passive investing that may help people figure out where they should invest or even how to how to get into syndication on on either end because i think a lot of people get hung up on it and most of us thought it was a scam before we realized hey this is actually pretty awesome yeah so i'll I'll go through the steps you know number one is get to know like and trust the general partner so yeah that's great you're listening to podcasts like this if you're on bigger pockets what have you you should be able to find you know, a decent amount of general partners that are doing deals and that have some sort of track record, but you need to do your due diligence. So ask for referrals, talk to other individuals that have invested with this group, you know, get to know them, understand what their communication is like, how their monthly updates look like, listen to their webinars and get to know, you know, their structure and their team and why they like the submarket that they're in. All of that's critically important. Step two, research the market, like I said before. So just make sure that you're well aware of what market you're investing in and, you know, why it's beneficial to invest in that, that market. And if there's any red flags, there's plenty of investment opportunities out there. So if you're, you know, if you're getting that gut feel where you're like, gosh, I just don't know about this, just hold off and wait for the next opportunity. Yeah. Step three, analyze the property. Don't be afraid to ask for financials or information if the general partnership team isn't providing that. And, you know, educate yourself. Make sure that you know what you're looking at. So understand the rent growth and the vacancy and the other income and how much they're pushing income. Yeah. What type of debt they have on the property. That's critically important. Yeah, yeah. And again, especially now, (laughs) it is. It's extremely important. And that's, you know, you have a lot of investors out there. Right now, general partners that are in hot water because they put, you know, the incorrect debt in place or they just didn't structure it properly. So that's super important. And then know the team, you know, just know who's behind the curtain. You know, one one of the important questions that I like to ask when I'm doing a passive investment is, are you doing this full time? Do you have enough time to properly asset manage the deal? Because there's a lot of syndicators out there where you know, they might be working 60, 70, 80 hours a week on their, their corporate career yeah. when they're trying to do the syndication on the side and they just don't have the time to properly asset manage. And if you just let the third party property management company go and let them do their thing, you, your investment is going to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. You can find that out on the small scale too. try getting yeah. just a two family and then getting property management. Nobody cares about just having one, two family. It's a, uh, yeah, those are really good tips. I learned a lot. I The first syndication book I read was The Hands-Off Investor by Brian Burke, who I've had on the show. And the, the first point is right on. It's like, and then I realized that when I started to get into syndications looking myself, it was like the most important thing to me is the operator. And then I also always want to know how much skin they have in the game, because at least if the ship goes sideways, I want them to be on the same ship as me, which is so crazy. You would think that all operators have money in the game, but you'd be crazy if you thought that because it's not the case. Am I right about that? Oh, you're 100% spot on. And, you know, and in addition to having skin in the game, make sure you ask that. Understand that or understand if this general partnership team has liquidity and has the network yeah. to back the deals. Because if they're putting together a 200 unit apartment complex, you know, let's say they're sticking 100 grand into it. But they only have ten grand left over afterwards. I mean, what happens if you know if stuff hits the fan? How are they going to get that liquidity in their only? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the world of capital calls that are exactly. going on so much. And yeah, that's a great point because I don't want a capital call. I, I would be infuriated 
because like that's exactly why I'm investing in syndications is to avoid putting in more money. I want to get more money yep. slowly over time and then on the outsell. But that's a really good point. Yeah. And it, I think that's why those other three points that you mentioned are really important too. Uh, I don't want to do all the work that the syndicator does, but I should know the market. You know, like I'm in a syndication in Chicago. I didn't overstudy the market, but I had studied it enough and knew the operator enough to be like, it's, this is just a full go. Like, I'm good. The build date was really important to me as well. You know, from buying apartment complexes, because you said the one in Nashville was like a late 20s build, which is awesome. And the the one I'm in is like, yeah, like a 2020 build or something. Mm -hmm. So to me, you're just taking huge maintenance things off the table, you know, because you have the due diligence phase. You're buying a 1920, you know, 100 unit stuff's coming for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you, if you're doing that, if you're buying an older property, which we buy, you know, some properties built in the sixties or seventies, you just have to factor in a good amount of CapEx in addition to what your general, you know, business yeah, yeah. is because things are, like you said, they're going to come up, you're going to have plumbing issues, you're going to have electrical issues. And there's some great opportunities with those old properties, but yeah, exactly. you need to be super, super conservative on your CapEx spend. Yeah, and I think you have to be really good at your due diligence inspection phase, mm -hmm. especially when you're at 100 units to make sure you're bringing in the right people because you hit one really important. A lot of times the plumbing was installed correctly and done the right way for the time that it was built, but it's no longer to code. So yep. on a transfer, you're either going to have to do it or you're suffering issues. And that comes with obviously heating and cooling as well. And these are all things that long term, you could have a huge you know, change in value by making things more streamlined, but that CapEx will hit you in the face <laughs> right away. And, and again, you know, shoot the investment in the foot from the start, which is not a great way to start it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think a lot of investors out there, you know, they might factor in the proper CapEx spend, you know, for these older properties, year one, two, three, but a lot of times it gets put to the wayside, year four, five, six, seven, and all of a sudden, they get three or four years into the project, they've ran out of CapEx money, and those general plumbing issues, HVAC issues, electrical issues continue to come up, and they might not have the funds to take care of them. So make sure you're looking out long term and projecting you know, a CapEx spend for longer than you even project to hold the property. Yeah, these are all really good points. I think this is a really helpful episode for for anyone who wants to invest in syndications. But I, I think that, you know, one of the things that created this podcast is the mindful approach to real estate investing. And as it talks about syndications, like, I really think like you just want to be doing as much due diligence as you can and being careful, make sure that your asset is solid. Because as you said, the more units, the more things that can also go wrong on the larger scale. And I think it's just important to take a little bit of a breath, make sure that you're getting the full due diligence on the property, you know, and make sure that you don't have FOMO. I think everybody's suffering from FOMO. And, you know, you have people who, hey, I have 500 grand in the bank, I want to invest, but I don't really want to pay attention to who I'm investing with. Those are the people who make bad investments because they're low on time. I, I think, and I want to get your opinion on this, you want to be a passive investor, okay, but spend a lot of time on the upfront, making sure you're doing enough so that you're not just handing your money over and hoping for the best. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, think of it this way. If you're sticking $150,000 or $100,000 into a syndication, you know how much time and effort did it take you to make that money? Probably a decent amount of time, even if you're making a ton of money. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah it's not over. Yeah, you didn't just hit hit the jackpot it, there. That's... Exactly. I mean, just sticking in, you know, a few hours, listening to the webinar, doing some research on the market, some research on the general partnership team before you invest those funds. I mean, it's just going to be time very, very well spent. Yeah. So for somebody, just say a brand new investor who's getting started the way that you did, single family investor now in this market, what would be one piece of advice that you could give them from get to single to multi and then get up along the way into large scale multi? What would be, you know, you have a lot of experience and you, and you make decisions along the way where you're like, well, I could have done better at that one. What's one piece that you could drop that could maybe help people start to figure out how they may scale in the future? Yeah, I would say number one, and I know I've mentioned it a couple times throughout this podcast, but just piggyback on someone else's success. So find someone that's done what you're looking to do. And you know whether it's passively invest with them or provide some value and team up with them, I just think that's going to allow you to go so much faster, 
so much higher and it's going to alleviate a ton of mistakes. So I would highly, highly recommend that. And also right now, you know, mid 2024, I do think that there's a great opportunity in the multifamily space because values have plummeted by about 20 to 30 percent because of what yeah. interest rates have done. Whereas if you look in the single family market, you know, pricing has continued to rise in most markets in the US. So if you can get into multifamily, you know, I do think that now is a great opportunity to do so. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it has to be the right one, but I think even more opportunities are coming as these calls and debts are just not looking in good shape. And there's going to be people to be able to pick up the crumbs, put it back together. One thing I was thinking before we hop off, but I, I think it'd be really smart for somebody who, if you're in, uh, you know, you're going to meetups, if two people, if you invest and a friend invests in the same syndication, that would be really, really smart. You know, because you don't have to invest together, but if you're both investing in the same syndication, you can be pinballing stuff off each other and saying like, hey, should we ask this question? Because it is hard if you're just one person, it's almost like embarrassing to, to you feel like, I don't want to ask them this question. I think this is really stupid. And then you don't ask it. And later it would have been a great question. If you have somebody there that you know, maybe it makes it a little easier to present it together. What do you think about that strategy? I, I, I just came a, up with, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great idea. You know, the more sets of eyes that you can get on an investment opportunity, the better. You know, I think about us and we still have a couple of our coaches or mentors take a look at our underwriting. Yeah. Program. You know, we've done 20 plus multifamily transactions, most of them 150 plus units. And you still sometimes you miss things. And so you want to make sure that you have that second, third, fourth set of eyes on a deal. So I, I love that idea. What's your general hope for transition time to sell? I mean, you're not going to keep them all. So what's generally, of course, every property, depending on the upkeep and maintenance and the numbers, but what's an average in terms of how long you hold a property until the out is for the investors? Yep. So typically we have a five-year projected hold and we'll typically set up the debt where it's you know somewhere between five to 10 years just to give ourselves the proper runway. And again, you know that's where a lot of investors are in heat right now because they put on you know, a two or three year bridge loan with oh, yeah. extensions. Now they can't get the extensions and they're forced into selling. Whereas if you can ride through an economic downturn, whether it just be in the real estate space or, you know, general economic downturn, you know, you're going to do that much better and be able to exit when it's actually beneficial for you to exit. Yeah, a two-year debt does not sound good to me <laughs> to invest in a cent. Like, I want to make sure we... Because I want to do it the right way, too. Even if I'm passive, I want to know that, like, you know, if you're buying 150 apartments, that's 150 people living there. I mean, I still want it to be, you know, the best possible solution. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mike, is the best place for people to get in touch with you at GraniteTowersEquityGroup.com? Correct. So if you go to GraniteTowersEquityGroup.com, we have a contact us page. And if you fill that out, you'll get added to our you know database. And we'll make sure to send you our ebook, Four Steps to Successful Passive Investing, as well as our free investment passive tracker, which is a super nice tool to use. Yeah. And you guys, you and Dan have the podcast, Keeping It Real Estate. We do. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I think we're about 145 episodes in. So oh, you're right great. behind me where this I is know. 161 <laughs> for us right now. It's awesome though. Uh, yeah. Before we get to the final end here, don't you think, I mean, podcasts to me are such a great way for investors to just get information with no pressure. You know, if you, even if you're hearing a pitch in an ad somewhere, you can just shut it off or forward it. Right. Exactly. It's such a great tool. And, you know, a couple of tips for me, I, I typically put it on, you know, one and a half to two times speed so you can get through more content. And if a great tips comes up, push pause, yeah. you know, open your Apple notes or whatever, jot it down, send it over to yourself in the email, whatever you have to do. And it's just, yeah, it's a great way to take advantage of everyone's knowledge out there. Yeah, I mean, what could be better than just talking, investing, and knowing that someone somewhere may listen to this, hear it, and it could change everything that they've thought about investing, and we will never know. That's what I think is so cool. You know, maybe they find us at a conference 20 years later, and they're on an empire, and we had something to do with it. That's that's pretty awesome. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah, man. All right, great. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Is, it, is, that, is there any other good places to contact you, or is that the best through the site? Mm -hmm. No, nope, I would say reach out through the site and you can schedule a call with myself or Dan if you'd like through there as well. And yeah, we look forward to to connecting with you. Our podcast is on that website as well. So it's great yeah. at equity group.com and look forward to connecting with you. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate your time. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate yep. it. All right. That was Mike Roeder of Granite Towers Equity Group. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. I'm glad you're still here because if you've been listening the past few weeks, you know that we're doing episode previews at the end so you can see and hear what's coming up next week. Next week, my guest is Michael Chang, an Airbnb expert, and we're going to talk about all things short-term rental. We're going to talk a lot about arbitrage, and then we're going to talk about different strategies, how he manages the properties, and what he's looking for. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's different than the other short-term rental shows that we've had. He has a different point of view and a different way of doing it. Stay tuned. Next week, episode 162, Michael Chang. Thank you.